Well, good morning, everyone. I bring you greetings on behalf of the Capitol Hill Baptist Church over in Washington, D.C. It's a joy to be with you this morning. We pray for you often. We think of you. We're encouraged when we think of the witness for the gospel here in Northern Virginia. And it's with great affection that I come to bring you God's word this morning. I wonder what's on your to-do list today. Maybe it's a load of laundry that has been put off too long. Maybe it's a workout or an exercise you've been meaning to get into. What is on your to-do list? It's a basic fact of life that we never feel like we have enough time. One day ends, another day begins, and our to-do list only seems to grow longer. I'm reminded of a short story by J.R.R. Tolkien where he talks about this old man who has his life's work that he's trying to accomplish and the interruptions of daily life keep getting in the way. Eventually, he dies without ever having completed his project. But isn't this the story of all our lives? The great painter and inventor Leonardo da Vinci declared on his deathbed, I have offended God and mankind because my work did not reach the quality it should have. Michelangelo, perhaps the greatest sculptor of all time, declared on his deathbed, I'm still learning. The great writer Charles Dickens died with one manuscript unfinished. The great composer Franz Schubert left his unfinished symphony behind. Friends, each one of us will depart from this life with some dream or another unaccomplished, some hope unfulfilled. The writer's pen will finally drop from his unwilling hands with yet another novel unfinished. The painter's brush likewise betrays its owner, leaving another empty canvas. And death, the great leveler, leaves us all unwilling and unprepared, except for one man. There is one man who lived and died having accomplished everything he set out to accomplish. He died at a young age, at the age of 33. But his life wasn't cut short because he didn't die in vain. His life wasn't a tragedy, it was a victory. And his last words are words of hope and words of life. And it's those final words, those final words of Jesus from the Gospel of John that we've come to consider this morning. So I'd ask you to open your Bibles to John chapter 19. We're looking at verses 28 to 30. John chapter 19, verses 28 to 30. And as you turn there, I want you to ask the question that these verses will answer. What were the last words of Jesus, and what do they tell us about who he was and what he came to do? Read with me from John chapter 19, beginning in verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. As we meditate on these words of Jesus, these last words of Jesus this morning, I want us to ask one question. And that question is why? Why did Jesus choose these as his last words? What do they tell us about who he was and what he came to do? And here's my one sentence answer. Jesus became fully man to fulfill the scriptures by bearing the punishment that you and I deserve to bring us to God. Why were these Jesus' last words? Jesus became fully man to fulfill the scriptures by bearing the punishment that you and I deserve to bring us to God. I want to break that up in four points as we walk through this passage, beginning first... Jesus said, I thirst because he became fully man. That's the first part of what we learn in these verses. These verses are teaching the humanity of Christ. The humanity of Christ. And we need to remember this because sometimes we have a less than biblical view of Jesus because we have a less than human view of Jesus. 
Sometimes we think about Jesus as if he sort of floated through existence ephemerally, as if he didn't experience what it was really like to be human, as if he didn't know the ups and downs, the physical trials, the suffering, the abandonment, the, the normal course of life that comes with being a human being. But he did. And these verses teach us that though truly God, Jesus really became man in every way, even to the point of experiencing thirst. See, the Bible teaches that Jesus' incarnation, that is, his becoming man, was not an act of subtraction. He didn't put off his divinity to become man. No, truly God, he became truly man, and he experienced what it meant to be human. I was on a backpacking trip a few years ago in the Rocky Mountains with some friends. We were climbing these beautiful mountains. Every day we had heavy packs. We camped at a different place and walked back and forth. It was wonderful. But on the last day, we wanted to do one of the tallest peaks. So we left our packs at the car and we set out on our way. We knew it was going to be a difficult hike. We knew that there were no active sources of water along the path. And so we took as much water as we could carry. Uh, but it wasn't enough. About halfway up the hike, we were out of water, but we wanted to press on to the top. I started experiencing some dehydration, maybe some the effects of altitude with the sun beating down on us. By the time we got to the top of the mountain, my head was beating. I felt terrible. I said, I, I need to start going down. And I knew it was going to be a four-hour hike down to the base. No water. It's a scary place to be. Uh, soon enough, uh, my body started to go into shock. Uh, my body began expelling all the remaining liquid, which is a terrible sign of dehydration. You want to keep that in. You don't want to lose what's there. I started wondering, am I going to die up here on this mountain? Just as we got below the tree line, I looked down and saw this small trickle of water coming out from underneath a rock. So small, I hadn't seen it when we were coming up. We had a water pump. I collapsed there. My friends got me the water. It took about an hour to stabilize, but then I was all right. We were able to finish the hike and make it down fine. But I experienced on that day thirst in a way that I had never known it before. See, to be human is to thirst. We have needs. We need food. We need water. We're dependent beings. Need, Tozer writes, is a creature word and cannot be spoken of the Creator without threatening his self-sufficiency. So when we read here that Jesus said, I thirst, this is absolutely staggering. This is the creator of the universe, the one who invented water, saying, I thirst. So, so recap with me. When Jesus said, I thirst, he's not just saying, I'm thirsty. He's describing a state of extreme dehydration. You know, this is, this is happening on Friday afternoon, but just think of what Jesus has gone through in the last 24 hours. Uh, Jesus hasn't eaten anything or had anything to drink since his, his, his dinner with the disciples on Thursday night in the upper room. Uh, that dinner was followed by his praying in the Garden of Gethsemane all night long in a state of extreme anxiety and profuse perspiration leaving his body dehydrated from hours of agonizing prayer. Then he was betrayed in the early hours of Friday morning, and he faced hours of questioning without any sleep. In the morning, he faced further questioning before Herod and Pilate, all without one drop of water or morsel of bread. Before being sentenced to death, Pilate had ordered for Jesus to be scourged. Now, this scourging would would involve a, a whip with leather tails and sharp metal shards at the end of each tail. These bits of metal would dig into the flesh, ripping blood vessels, nerves, muscle, and skin. These, this scourging may have caused rib fractures. It may have caused internal bleeding. Jesus' body would, in all likelihood, have developed a high fever as infection set in throughout the body because of the open wounds. As a result, his mangled body would crave water because of the bleeding and sweating. Further blood loss resulted from the crown of thorns that were pressed into his head, these inch-long thorns. 
and the cumulative loss of blood would contribute to a state of hypovolemic shock, which is when the body's not able to pump enough blood to compens compensate for blood loss. And it's in this state of humiliation that Jesus' hands and feet were nailed to a cross, and he hung in the scorching heat of the Middle Eastern sun for three hours. Three hours, followed by three hours of darkness. Every breath required him to push with his feet. And it's after six hours on the cross that Jesus utters these words, I thirst. The one who spoke the universe into existence, the one who said, let the waters be gathered above into one place, and it was so, Genesis 1. The one who provided Israel with water from a rock in Numbers 20. The one who draw, draws up drops of water and causes it to rain, Job 36. The one who visits the earth and waters it abundantly, Psalm 65. Who turns rivers into desert and springs of water into thirsty ground. This is the one who said on the cross, I thirst. And we see in this Jesus humanity he experienced weakness and suffering, even as Philippians says, to the point of death. And here's why this matters for us. When we come to Jesus, we do not come to a Savior who is unsympathetic with our weaknesses. We do not come to God as someone who is distant or far off or who doesn't know what it's like. No, we come, as Hebrews 4 says, to one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Friends, we have a high priest who is able to sympathize with us in our weaknesses because he knows what it is like. And so Jesus' last words are an invitation they're an invitation for you to come to him in your weakness, in your brokenness, in your sickness, in your suffering, in your depression, your sin, your loneliness, your addiction, and to do so with confidence that we can find help and mercy and grace in time of need. I wonder if you have a friend who has experienced so much of life's ups and downs that you know you can come to them and tell them anything and they will listen, and they will love you. Do you have a friend like that? Kids, teenagers, do you know what it's like to have someone in your life? You can tell them anything, and you know that they'll listen, and they'll love you. Friends, that friend has nothing on Jesus. He knows what it's like, and he invites us to come to him. So Jesus said, I thirst, because he became fully man. But that's not the only reason. Although Jesus was thirsty, he was thirsty beyond anything that you and I have experienced. He didn't say, I thirst, for that reason alone. It's because earlier that day, we read in Mark 15, 22 to 23, that Jesus had been offered something to drink. He had been offered wine mixed with myrrh. This was a, a drink that elderly Jewish women offered to victims of crucifixion as an act of mercy. You see, this combination of wine and myrrh created a kind of nar narcotic, an anesthetic that was intended to alleviate some of the pain of crucifixion by putting victims in a semi-conscious state. So Jesus was offered this wine with myrrh, and he did the unthinkable. He refused. He said, no even though he was thirsty. He didn't take the wine with myrrh. Despite his suffering, despite his thirst, Jesus was not looking to numb the pain of the cross. He wasn't looking for an easy way out. He wasn't looking to avoid the suffering that he knew was coming. So why does Jesus here say, I thirst and take the sour wine? Well, this brings us to our second point. It was to fulfill the Scripture. That's our second point. Jesus said, I thirst to fulfill the Scriptures. He was fully man. He said, I thirst to fulfill the Scriptures. Look back at our verse. Verse 28. Knowing that all was now finished, he said, to fulfill the Scripture, I thirst. 
Jesus was looking to fulfill what God had promised in the Old Testament. This has been a theme throughout the Gospel of John. John is constantly trying to highlight and draw our attention to the fact that the cross was not a tragedy. It was a victory. The suffering Christ endured was not accidental. It was intentional. This is what he, he means when he says, knowing that all was now finished. Despite the appearance of tragedy, everything was happening exactly according to plan. We read this throughout the Gospel of John. In John 15, 25, Jesus says, the fact that they hated him without a cause, from Psalm 69, 2, which we read earlier in the service, this was to fulfill the, the prophecy from Psalm 69, 2, which says, more in number than the hairs of my head are those who hate me without a cause. Even when the disciples fled, when Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, was to fulfill Psalm 31. Those who see me in the street flee from me. After his betrayal by, G by Judas, Jesus says in John 17, 12, and in John 18, 32, that this was to fulfill Psalm 41, 9. Even my close friend, in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. When the soldiers divided Jesus' garments amongst themselves and cast lots for them in John 19, 24, they were unwittingly fulfilling the prophecy of Psalm 22, verse 18. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Yet for all of these fulfilled prophecies, Jesus knew on the cross that there was one more left to be fulfilled before he died. And that's Psalm 69. We read these verses earlier in the service. But just turn there with me to Psalm 69, or, or listen as I read it. And as you listen to this, think of the one it is who, who is saying these verses. It's, it's Christ on the cross experiencing this humiliation and, and suffering and thirst. Psalm 69, verse 1. I'll read a few verses. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters, and the flood sweeps over me. I am weary with crying out. My throat is parched. My eyes grow dim with waiting for my God. More in number than the hairs of my head are those who hate me without cause. Mighty are those who would destroy me, who attack me with lies. And then verses 20 and 21. Reproaches have broken my heart so that I am in despair. I looked for pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. They gave me poison for food. And for my thirst, they gave me sour wine to drink. Jesus knew that by saying these words, I thirst, the soldier standing at the foot of the cross would offer him this sour wine for him to drink to fulfill this passage of scripture from Psalm 69, written over a thousand years earlier. Now, this sour wine was not a pleasant drink. This wasn't like the wine mixed with myrrh that Jesus had been offered earlier. No, sour wine was a cheap drink. It was used by soldiers who needed to remain awake for extended hours of time. Almost like smelling salts, or think of like a red wine vinegar, something bitter to the taste. It was so strong that it would have the opposite effect of a narcotic. Instead of putting you to sleep, it would bring you to your senses. And so these, these soldiers didn't offer this sour wine to Jesus as an act of mercy. They did it to mock him. They, they did it to put a bitter taste in his mouth. But Jesus said, I thirst. And he took the sour wine to fulfill the scriptures. Here's why. Before he died, Jesus wanted for his disciples and for you and I to have rock-solid confidence in the word of God. And we would know that every word of God proves true. That he is a refuge for all who trust in him. This is true of everything the scriptures say. They are true in their entirety, Old Testament and New Testament. There is no promise made that will go unfulfilled. And Jesus said, I thirst to give us that confidence that we could know that every promise made of the Messiah was perfectly fulfilled. A few years ago, I was on a skiing trip with some friends. The, 
Conditions were terrible, but we only had one day to ski and we, we went anyway. It was icy, it was snowy, it was hard to see. And one friend who was there with me decided it would be a good time to try out snowboarding for the first time. Snowboarding and skiing are not the same. And just because you're good at skiing doesn't mean you're good at snowboarding. So we begin skiing, we go down a tough hill, and he takes a bad fall. He hits his head, and he blacks out. When he comes to, it's like he's on, on a five-minute loop. He's, he's forgotten where he is. He's forgotten what happened to him, and will explain things. And then he'll forget again and wonder, why am I here? And it was sort of funny at first until you realize how scary it is for him to, to have to constantly realize, what's, what's happening to me? Wh where am I? See, this was happening in February. But in January, he had begun memorizing the book of Ephesians. And what he realized is he would cycle back into a state of memory loss, but then he would begin to recount the book of Ephesians to himself. He would, he would remember Ephesians 2, 1. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world. But Ephesians 2, 8, by grace you have been saved through faith. And so whenever this would happen to him, and he would be like, what, what happened to me? I can't remember. We would say, Grayson, what's Ephesians 2, 1? Grayson, what's Ephesians 2, 8? And he would remember. And as everything was falling around him, falling apart, he was calling to mind the blood-bought promises of God. And the Lord used those passages he had memorized to reassure his heart in a time of anxiety. He didn't know what was going on around him, but he had a rock-solid foundation in God's Word. Friend, I don't know what particular trials you are going through right now. I don't know what suffering you're facing that is causing the world to, to disorient you. But God has given you blood-bought promises in His Word to carry you through. Even just in the Gospel of John, Jesus has promised, whoever comes to me, I will by no means cast out. He's promised, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. He has promised, I will see you again. And your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take that joy from you. Fred, what are you doing to store up these promises in your heart? So that when trials come, you know that you have a rock-solid foundation in God's Word. Jesus said, I thirst on the cross to fulfill the scriptures so that you and I would trust his words. But that's not the only thing. He, he became fully man. He fulfilled the scriptures. But third, I want you to see that Jesus said, I thirst because he had borne the wrath of God. Jesus said, I thirst because he had borne the wrath of God. Throughout the Old Testament, the theme of God's wrath is often pictured as a cup. You can read about this in Ezekiel, in Isaiah, in the Psalms. The judgment that God will pour out over the nations is pictured as a cup that God's enemies will drink. And they will drink it to the dregs. So Psalm 75, 8 says, In the hand of the Lord there is a cup with foaming wine, well mixed, and he pours out from it and all the wicked of the earth shall drain it down to the dregs. This, this cup was intended for God's enemies, for those who have sinned against him and rebelled against him by going their own way. And friends, that's you and me. I don't need to know you personally to know that you have sinned against God because I know my own heart and I know what the scripture says that there is none righteous, no, not one, that all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. A sin isn't just things we do, it's the orientation of our hearts away from God and toward ourselves. We don't need to be taught to do what's wrong. It comes naturally to us. And the consequence of that, according to the Bible, is God's wrath, pictured as a cup that all of God's enemies will drink. What Jesus did on the cross was to drink that cup of wrath 
in the place of anyone who would turn from their sins and trust in Him. He bore God's judgment in the place of those who He came to save. So that when Jesus said, it is finished in verse 30, He could say that because He had borne the punishment that you and I deserve. This is what was happening during those three hours of darkness. On the cross, an eternity of anguish was poured out on the sun. For three hours, the very flames of hell engulfed the sun, and no water could quench those flames. For three hours, the sword of God's justice struck the sun with no hand to restrain it. Do you remember how Jesus described the agony of hell in his parable in Luke 16, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus? This, this rich man who had lived his life apart from God pleads with an angel that someone might be sent to dip their finger in water for just a water to cool, uh, for just a drop of water to cool his tongue. For he says, I am in anguish in this flame. Jesus said, I thirst on the cross because that is the punishment he had endured. He comes out of this three hours of darkness having borne the wrath of God in the place of anyone who would turn from sin and trust in Him. Another detail that, that illuminates this for us, if you noticed it, when the soldiers hold up the sour wine on a sponge, they do it using a hyssop branch. In verse 29, that hyssop branch. Where have you seen that before in the Bible? Well, at the Passover, in Exodus 12, 22, the, the people are instructed to slay a lamb and to put its blood on the lintel of the house using a hyssop branch. So that when God's wrath comes over the Egyptians, the people of Israel can take refuge underneath the blood of the lamb so the judgment doesn't fall on them. In the same way that the hyssop branch was lifted up to spread blood on the lintel of the doors in Exodus 12, that cup of sour wine was lifted up to the Son of God to drink so that he would bear that punishment in our place. Sometimes people wonder, was Jesus bearing the punishment for our sins on the cross or after he died? You know, sometimes people think, well, maybe Jesus is being punished after he dies. That's why he's in the grave. And the correct answer theologically is, is no. Jesus bears the punishment that we deserve on the cross. And this is what turns Jesus' declaration in verse 30 into a victory cry. When Jesus says, it is finished, he was announcing that the wrath of God for our sins has been paid in full. It is finished. There, there is no more punishment that you and I deserve for our sins that will fall on us if we trust in Christ. This changes everything. A few years ago, I had the privilege of preaching at a church in Boston called Tremont Temple. And on that occasion, I shared a story with them about something that had happened in their very building back in 1863. On, on New Year's Eve in 1863, Boston's white and black abolitionists crowded into this Baptist church called Tremont Temple. It was an important night. It was an important event on, in, the, in the life of the nation because... President Lincoln had promised that on New Year's Day, the Emancipation Proclamation would go into effect, declaring the abolition of slavery. And so crowds packed into Tremont Temple, and they waited, and they waited. Speeches were held. There was a time of celebration. But as the evening wore on and they came closer and closer to midnight, people began to get nervous. They began to wonder if Lincoln had decided against trying to issue this great edict of freedom. Speakers present like Frederick Douglass tried to calm the crowd and lighten the moon, but, mood, but a, a general restlessness finally descended over the crowd until a messenger ran through shouting, it is coming! It is on the wires, meaning that a telegraph was on its way with the language of the Emancipation Proclamation. Finally, this complete proclamation was read to the crowd and jubilation ensued. 
Can you imagine the cheering? One eyewitness wrote, it is the dawning of a new day. Friends, when Jesus hung on the cross and said those words, it is finished, he was announcing our emancipation proclamation from sin and death, from a slavery far worse than any human slavery, from a slavery to sin and death. And yes, it was the dawning of a new day. And this is the good news for, for all of us who have sinned against God. We can know forgiveness for our sins by trusting in Christ. All of us have, have turned our own way against God, but God offers this freedom from sin and death by trusting in His Son. Oh, if you have not trusted in Christ, if you have not received that emancipation proclamation, would you turn to Christ today? There's nothing you need to do other than to trust Him, to believe that He died for your sins according to the Scripture, and that He rose again from the dead victorious. If you put your trust in Christ today, you can know that freedom from sin and death and hell even today. And friends, this is the joyous privilege that we have as Christians when we evangelize. When we share the gospel with others, we are announcing an emancipation proclamation. We're declaring that sin has been paid in full for all who turn from their sins and trust in Christ. Oh, I encourage you to, to step into this joyous work of, of evangelism, not as a burden, not as a duty, but as an immense privilege as ambassadors of the king to declare it is finished. And friends, this is good news for all of us as, as Christians who continue to struggle with sin. Uh, because we can know that when Jesus said it is finished, there is nothing you or I can do to decrease that work. It is Finished. Jesus said, I thirst because he became fully man to fulfill the scriptures, to bear the wrath of God. But there's one more reason I want us to see, and I'll, I'll close with this. Jesus said, I thirst to bring us to God. Jesus said, I thirst to bring us to God. All throughout the Bible, this language of thirst is associated with longing, with desires, with a search for satisfaction that nothing in this world can satisfy. You remember the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. All her life she had been searching for satisfaction in life and the things of this world. In relationships that ended. In the hope of a husband that failed. And when Jesus approaches her at the well, he uses this language of thirst. He says, I have the living water that can satisfy that nothing in this worth can. And when Jesus comes out of bearing the wrath of God for sin... He expresses his longing to be with his Father in this language of thirst. In the same way that he prayed in John chapter 17 to be restored to the same glory that he had with the Father before the creation of the world. He longed to return to be with his Father. And Jesus is teaching us here to direct all of our longings to God. All of us have longings that nothing in this world can satisfy. And if we try to spend our lives seeking satisfaction and fulfillment in the things of this world, we'll end up like da Vinci, or like Schubert, or like Michelangelo declaring on our deathbed, it wasn't enough. I didn't finish everything I set out to accomplish. But if our trust is in Christ, and if we direct the longings of our hearts to God, to the only one, who can satisfy us. We can know that when we die, we have accomplished everything that God set out for us to do. And that God is preparing eternal satisfaction for us with Him in Himself. This is the invitation throughout the Bible. Isaiah 55. Come, come. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come and eat. This is Revelation 22, where we see a river flowing from the throne to satisfy thirsty souls. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Let the one who hears say, Come. And the one who is thirsty, Come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. These words are an invitation for you to bring your desires to God. Friends, Jesus' last words are words of hope and comfort 
because they teach us that Jesus became fully man to fulfill the scriptures, to bear the punishment that you and I deserve to bring us to God. Will you come to him today? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you that you are a faithful God. That no promise you have made will ever fall to the ground, but you will fulfill them all for your namesake. We praise you that you invite us and welcome us to come to you as a merciful high priest. And know that you hear, that you know us, that you love us, and that we're accepted before you through your Son. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.